This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome you to Glory Day on the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. And it's a little bit cooler than last weekend. Yeah, it's kind of nice to get a little break there. So I'm going to share some signs. When you, when you travel around, sometimes there's some kind of interesting things that get put up on church signboards. Sign outside a Kentucky church. Traveling to outer space, instructions inside. <laughs> Sign outside a Louisiana church. Tough week? We're open Sundays. Sound, sign outside Faith Temple Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Neighborhood watch provided by the Sermonator. <laughs> sign on a, uh, seen on a sign in a vacant piece of land in Plano, Texas. You'll love the guy who moves in here. His son, too. Future home of Messiah Lutheran Church. <laughs> seen on a bumper sticker in a Chicago suburb. Proud parents of an Our Lady of Humility Honor student. <laughs> I like this one. Valentine's Day sign outside Lidditz Moravian Church in Pennsylvania. Come in for a holy hug. And then one of my favorites also. Uh, sign outside St. Paul's United Church of Christ. Best sausage supper in St. Louis. Come and eat Pastor Thomas Ressler. <laughs> Hey, let's take a moment and turn to our neighbor to our left and right, tell them how glad we are. That Following our service, we'll be gathering in the Fellowship Hall for a time of getting acquainted and uh, sharing about our experiences. Please stick around for that. We'd love to hear how God's been active in your life. Right now, I'm going to invite you to stand as we join in our opening hymn. Gather us in and make us your own. Gather us in. 
you to join me in the opening responses. I follow, Lord, behind you. Where you walk, I place my feet. Where you weep, I shed my tears. Where you joy, I sing. And where you lay down your life, I lay down my loves, my idols, all that holds me to this world. I follow, Lord, behind you. I am giving you worship with my whole life. I am giving you praises with my whole tongue. I am giving you love with my whole heart. I am giving you affection with my whole sense. I am giving you my existence with my whole mind. I am giving you my soul, O God of all. join me in the prayer of the day. We pray together. O oh God, God, through suffering and rejection, you bring, you bring forth our salvation, salvation. And, and by the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel, we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Congregation may be seated. first reading is from the book of Isaiah 50 um, verses 4 through um, 9. The image of the servant of the Lord is one of the notable motifs in the book of Isaiah. Today's reading describes the mission of the servant whom early Christians associated with Jesus. Like Jesus, the servant does not strike back at his detractors but trust in God's steadfast love. So, Isaiah 50. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. 
I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. And this ends the reading. <laughs> This morning's second reading is from James 3, verses 1 through 12. This text uses various images to illustrate how damaging and hurtful the way we speak to and about others can be. Not only are we to control our speech, but what we say and how we say it are to reflect our faith. James 3, 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts a great of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, 
The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It strains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this not this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This ends the reading. The Holy Gospel for this 17th Sunday after Pentecost comes to us from Mark, the 8th chapter, beginning with the 27th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. The 8th chapter of Mark is a very pivotal one in his gospel. It marks a huge change in the whole thrust and direction of where Mark is taking his readers. For the first seven chapters, the identity of Jesus is kept a secret. And nobody really knows who this guy is. In chapter 8, his identity is slowly revealed. And as it is revealed, there's a crisis, okay? And the crisis is people have a picture of what Messiah will be, and Jesus does not fit it. Nevertheless, he is the one sent from God. Please join me in today's gospel reading. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd and his disciples, and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Congregation may be seated.
the question on the cover of an old issue of Life magazine is as relevant today as it was back in 1994. Who was he? Who was Jesus of Nazareth? If you were to pull those who knew him best, you would have been amazed at the variety of responses that you received. His family, they would tell you that he was crazy and he needed to be locked up. The religious leaders and influencers would tell you that he was a troublemaker and an agitator, constantly hanging out with all the wrong types of people. The common people would tell you that he was a miracle worker and a storyteller whose heart was full of compassion for the sick and the marginalized. And Herod, the king with a guilty conscience, he would tell you that Jesus is a ghost, the ghost of John the Baptist, come back from the dead to haunt him, to make him miserable. As we turn our attention to today's gospel, I think it's safe to assume that when Jesus traveled to the villages located in the area of Caesarea Philippi, the whole countryside was abuzz about the true identity of this mysterious rabbi from Galilee. I mean, wherever he went, the word preceded him about his miracles and his stories and all the amazing things that he was doing. Consequently, Jesus asked a question which is on everybody's mind. Who do people say that I am? And the response of his followers is a recitation of the local gossip, a summary of what Mark's readers have already discovered about Jesus in the earlier chapters of Mark's gospel. Some say you were John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. But Jesus isn't interested in what other people have to say about him. He wants to know what his followers think, and so he ups the ante a bit. And he asks them, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? It's the most important question that they, as well as all of us seated here today, will ever grapple with. Who do we say Jesus is? Just think of the variety of responses his disciples could have offered up. The most amazing teacher they had ever heard explained the scriptures. The smartest person they had ever encountered. A rabbi whose heart seemed especially attuned to the things of God. A charismatic prophet who could accomplish the seemingly impossible, even miracles. A friend who would never abandon them in their time of need. A revolutionary who wanted to disrupt the status quo and bring to his nation the justice and shalom it longed for. And lastly but not least, the most courageous person that they had ever met. Yet all these descriptions fall short of the mystery that is Jesus of Nazareth. While each of the characterizations are true, they aren't the whole picture. There is something else about Jesus which is profoundly significant, but which isn't always easy to put into words. Yaroslav Pelikan, in his book, Jesus Through the Centuries, offers this insight. There was a great teacher and gathered around him was a small group of faithful followers. They listened to his message and were absolutely transformed by it. But the message alienated the power structure of his time, which finally put him to death, but did not succeed in eradicating his message, which is stronger now than ever. That description would equally apply both to Jesus and to Socrates but nobody's ever built a cathedral in honor of Socrates. Socrates called upon people to think straight, but with Jesus, there's more than just teaching. There's a transcendent dimension beyond the here and now, a source of hope and true meaning. In our gospel for today, Peter hits the bullseye when he makes a confession that Jesus is who? The Messiah promised by God in the scriptures. 
Praise God, Peter had the courage to offer up this amazing insight. Yet even Peter is confused about what this means, both for Jesus and also for Jesus' followers. When Jesus tells the disciples that his central purpose is to go to Jerusalem and to suffer and to die a horrible death, what is Peter's response? Hell no! (laughs) Over my dead body, you're never going to do that. That's crazy talk. And you know, if we were in Peter's shoes, we would say the same thing. I mean, this is crazy what Jesus is saying. It doesn't fit the picture of what a Messiah is. So, Jesus, of course, isn't going to take what Peter says lying down. (laughs) He's going to address what Peter is talking about because he realized that this is really the crux of the matter. Human nature wants the glory of victory without the shame and abuse that invariably come with self-sacrifice, the blessing and grace of God without the cost obedience to God entails. In his book, The Dangerous Act of Worship, Mark Laberton tells of a woman who belonged to a church that he pastored in the Bay Area, who experienced firsthand what it means to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Her name is Susan, and she's as bright and energetic as they come. Having achieved success in the academic world by earning a doctorate, Susan then went on to achieve success in the workplace by securing a job in uh, science education as a teacher. A wonderful occupation. She worked with kids her first love, and brought all the passion, intelligence, humor, and creativity that she could to this task. But she kept feeling that God in Jesus wanted her to take greater risks. In time, she decided to buy a home in an impoverished African-American neighborhood in Berkeley, across the street from a park in a very small community center. Slowly, faithfully, She built relationships with her neighbors, especially the children of a troubled family. She became a kind of surrogate mother for those kids, doing all she could to love and support each and every one of them. Because of how she cared, one day the violence next door entered her own life when she was attacked by a visitor to the neighbor's home. The physical and emotional trauma brought pain and confusion All all Susan had done was attempt to love these kids next door. And what had happened? Trauma. Hard stuff. After time passed and the wounds had been addressed, it seemed that she would have to sell her house and move away. Susan found a wonderful job opportunity in New York City. The week she left, she and Pastor Mark celebrated God's faithfulness through the deep challenges she had faced in her neighborhood, and thanked God for opening this new chapter in his call on her life. Her first week in New York marked the 9-11 terror attacks on the Twin Towers. The damage done to Susan's block was so great, she was unable to live in her home for many, many months. Meanwhile, the gospel is still the same, and God's call for love, mercy, and justice is still the redefining reality of her life. The trauma didn't undo her. It simply became an avenue in which to express her profound faith in God. Does this sound like anybody you know? Recently, our church council began reading the book Slow Church, by C. Christopher Smith and John Pattison. In the book, the authors introduce a really interesting idea that they call the gospel of the coffee bean. I love it. They write, as coffee lovers, we sometimes think of the gospel as a coffee bean. We can't experience the pleasures of coffee directly from the bean. It is experienced indirectly. As the bean is roasted, put through the fire, so to speak, ground to a powder, and then subjected to boiling water. We're confident 
that God desires for us to find joy and deep pleasure in our local faith communities. But we're equally, equally convinced that it is futile to look for that joy directly. One of the great paradoxes of the gospel is that we find supreme joy indirectly as we go through the fire, are ground up, and poured out for each other. This process of giving ourselves up for one another is at the very heart of the way of Jesus, who, for the sake of the joy set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. As history has shown us, there are a lot of ways to answer the question, who was Jesus? Poet, prophet, iconoclast, moral example, teacher, mystic, and revolutionary. The list of potential answers seems endless. And you see them all on the cover of your bulletin this morning, all those titles that we have given Jesus. Here's what I think. None of them get to the core of the matter unless they include a cross. When Jesus asks the question, who do you say I am, he is looking for more than a verbal hurrah or a burst of sudden enthusiasm. Rather, Jesus is looking for folks willing to live cruciform lives. No wonder Peter got upset and tried to stop Jesus from going ahead with his plans. He didn't want to pick up a cross, nor do we. Friends in Christ, we are recipients of God's abundant and unmerited grace. But it doesn't come without a cost. Christ laid down his life to set us free from the things that bog us down and enslave us. We, in turn, are called to live lives that honor that sacrifice. Jesus challenges his followers to take up their crosses and to embrace the pain and suffering of the world around them. Contrary to the world's focus on achieving happiness and individual success, Jesus asserts that those who hang on to their lives will ultimately lose them, while those who are willing to lose their lives will experience God's blessing. We are called to live cross-shaped lives that bless others in the wider world around us. If that means that we embark on a path that our peers are really skeptical of, so be it. That is what Jesus ultimately did for us. And all God's people said, Amen. let's stand for the hymn of the day.
Drawn together in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray with confidence for the church, God's good creation, and all who are in need. We pray for the church throughout the world, for, uh, form us into communities of forgiveness and grace. Help us to notice where you are calling us into new relationships and to give us courage to embrace the uncomfortable and unfamiliar. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We pray for the earth and all its inhabitants. Protect lands at risk of wildfire and heal dying forests. Where fire brings destruction, raise up new growth. Guide us in, trending, in tending precarious ecosystems. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for those who govern nations, tribes, and cities. Open them to the cries of people in need. Direct them in shaping policies that prioritize the health and well-being of all who struggle with hunger and housing insecurity. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for all who are ill, all who are lonely or anxious, and all who grieve. Draw them close to you and soothe them with the promise of your enduring love. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for teachers, professors, librarians, school administrators, staff, and all who support the education of young people. Sustain them as they shape learning communities rooted in scholarship and authenticity. We pray for children of all ages in their learning. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We remember our beloved dead, who with the great cloud of witnesses bear witness to your saving grace. Accompany us in our pilgrimage of faith, that we too place our hope and trust in you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust these and all our prayers to you, holy God, in the name of your beloved child, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also Let us share that marvelous peace with one another. pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good and your love endures forever. 
who bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us share together in the prayer our Savior taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Teresa Burleson shares these words. Jesus is the laughter of God, still calling us to leave our nets, to see with a child's eyes, to take the risk of radical love. And those who will be poured out, he still turns into wine. In this meal, Jesus invites us into a special fellowship where we experience God's love so profoundly that we can't contain it. We can't keep it to ourselves. It has to be shared with our neighbor. And he actually instills within us the confidence and ability to do that as he comes to reside in our hearts and free us from that which uh, holds us back. That's very powerful. And again, it's made possible through the implementation of this meal. By instituting it at the Last Supper, Jesus said, whenever you do this, I will be there, and I will equip and empower you to be my disciple so that you can go out into the world and share my love with those you encounter. So I encourage you to think about that today as you come forward. For the distribution, please come up the aisle to my right where I'll be waiting with the bread. After receiving the bread, there'll be identical stations on each side of me where you can receive wine or grape juice. The wine is the darker color, the grape juice the lighter. If you prefer to take communion at your seat, there are also small cups and gluten-free wafers in the back. Come, for all is now ready.
body of Christ broken for you. 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 The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you. The 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 body of Christ. The body of Christ broken for you. 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 The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you. Please rise. And now may the body and blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you in his most precious grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.
Congregation may be seated, and at this time I'd like to invite those with birthdays or anniversaries to uh, please come forward. No takers? That's okay. All right. Woo! Uh, and Mary Kate Gearing had her 80th birthday yesterday. So yeah, we've got a couple to celebrate. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. May the Lord bless and keep you, love and care for you, too. Are there any announcements that folks would like to? We'll start with Mary. Good morning. Um, tomorrow night, I've invited anyone who would like to come to my house uh, to discuss this uh, draft of a social statement on civic light and life and faith my voice um, <clears throat> and I would like to know today because this is a, a very long thing it's like a little book and we need to have copies for whoever's attending if you don't already have one some of the council members do have them so uh, there is a sign up sheet on the kiosk and I would really enjoy uh, to hear your point of view Last Sunday, we celebrated Rally Sunday with a great barbecue and picnic, outdoors, games. Well, that usually begins the um, Sunday school season. As you know, we have a little bit of lighter attendance. Um, our membership of children and youth in our um, church, that's okay. All of us are children of God, right? <laughs> okay, so um, Barbara is not... Barbara Johnson is not here today. She is a frequent traveler <laughs> with her husband. But she will be teaching a Sunday school class at the end of this month. And I will be leading a fun game and crafts once a month as well. Seasonal, always church related. But that will be not just for children, but for all ages. So next week, I'll be leading some fun games. I think in the back half of the fellowship hall, we don't have every table taken up, so I think we can do that. That will follow a little bit of fellowship time, and then we'll come to you <laughs> and have fun. And next month, we'll be doing making some cards for certain people and um, craft decor. I have a lot of different fun things in mind for our, our coming year. So I hope you will feel free to join us next week. All are invited. And I wanted to mention that um, choir practice again is Wednesday night. As you see, we're fortunate that everybody's back, but we can always use some more. And that's Wednesday at 5.30. Is it? Yes. Okay. We're going to be fluctuating. And then also bells is on Thursday. And we're still down a couple of bells that are committed to the season. And so if you can come, or if you'd like to, you know, if you have questions about it, please see Donna. I'm sorry she's not here today. She's not feeling well, but um, she'll be around. You can reach her through the um, phone directory. Thank you. We are going to be quilting on Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. Last time we had seven people come. It was wonderful. We got four quilts tied. Anyway, hope to see you. Thursday at 10. And if you're going to the melodrama, please pay by today. We need to pay in advance. So my husband didn't pay. Last week, we passed out some surveys for fellowship. Uh, many of you did that. If you did not, there are still a few in the back. And again, this is a chance to uh, stack up if you want to um, do another one, you know, just to <laughs> fill out the ballot. <laughs> Uh, you're very welcome to do that, okay? So those are in the back. It's, it's, it's legal. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Please stand for the blessing. 
May joy be yours this day as you lift and carry the cross, a cross that is your own, a cross freely chosen, a cross that brings you to life even as it brings life to others and healing to creation. Amen. Amen. Jesus.